Well, today, folks, I want us to pray because what I'm going to be sharing with you, I believe, is one of the most important messages I've ever shared. And uh, I've got a title, Life is from God to All. Well, let me say that again. I want you to understand it. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Life is from God to all. You say, I didn't really mean that to all part, did he? Well, I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, I wrote this intro down. The reason I wrote it because I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave anything out what I was thinking. Folks, I don't want to make the scriptures say what they don't say. Can you go along with that? I don't want to make the scriptures say what they don't say. But I don't want to miss what they have always said either. I don't want to make the scriptures say what they don't say. But I don't want to miss what they've always said. And tragically, I think we're doing that. If you go back from before the New Testament was even written, if you go back early, and as the New Testament was being compiled, the early church fathers, the ones that were closest, closest to the time of Christ and to the disciples, the early church fathers, the early church, had a more inclusive thing if you read the early Ignatius, Augustine, you read some of these guys and some of the early church fathers, and you'll see we would call them heretics today, or say we, some people would, because you see the church, modern Western theology. Now, in Eastern theology, like the Eastern Orthodox Church, they have, uh, they've always been, they, they really never strayed too far from what was the early church and what they believed. Now, they've got their issues, just like all religion, just like all mankind's religions do. But you see, in the early church, with the early church fathers, they believed that God has given his life to all men, and all men were included in what he did, giving them his life, taking on their sin, giving them his life taking on their sin, becoming sin, and giving them his righteousness. You say, where in the world do you get that? Uh, that's one of those things that I was missing in the Bible. When it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He who knew no sin became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in himself, in him. He's, he's in us. So the Bible says that God was in the world, reconciling the world to himself. We're to be reconcilers, according to Ephesians, I mean, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're reconcilers. Does that, we can't do that. We can't do what Christ did. No. But the way we become reconcilers is that we tell people what Christ has already done, not what he will do. And it's really important that we share this as fact. And it is fact. The Bible says that we were reconciled to him while we were enemies. Romans 5.10, you had nothing to do with this reconciliation. The Bible says that we were justified by his blood. The blood of Christ justifies. We had nothing to do with that. The Bible says that we were saved by his life. We have nothing to do with that. It was all him. The Bible talks about the first Adam sinned. As a result, there was condemnation to all men. And people give him great power because this was, this was imputed to all men, this sin. But it also goes on to say that the obedience of the last Adam, the one, brought justification of life to all men. That's what it says. And that's something that I missed. Well, in the book of Acts, beginning in chapter 17, verse 22, we're going to see about this life. Today, we're going to look at what people have always said and what they've always believed. Let me just read verse 22. I'm going to read a while, then we're just going to talk about it. Just when you read this, most people just skim right over this because, ready? Here's the reason people skim right over this in Acts. By the way, Acts was penned by Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke, who also wrote the book of Luke. And Luke was real precise. He was a medical doctor. And he wrote down everything he saw that was happening. And he was precise about how he wrote it. And he wrote it in the order that it happened. Here we go. Uh, so Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus. 
and said, men of Athens, he was in Athens, Greece, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Really religious. <laughs> George Foreman, he was a great boxer, still alive, still a great man. He was a boxer and he was a great boxer. He won the Olympics, heavyweight champion in the Olympics. He was two time, uh, two different times world heavyweight champion. And he was very religious. I heard him interviewed one time by Howard Cosell and he says, he said, uh, George, you're very, I'm not doing very good, Howard Cosell. You're very religious. And George goes, that's right. I'm very religious, very religious. Only problem was he wasn't a believer. Later on, he became a believer. And the religion went by the wayside. And life took over. And that was the people here in Athens, Greece. They were very religious. But they didn't know the one true God. They didn't know the living God. But let's keep reading. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. I want to say this. They had an altar to the unknown God. At least they were honest. They say, we don't even know who he is. The unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all. Now, in the English, it adds people. It wasn't in the original, all. Since he himself gives to all. Here's what he gives to all. Ready? Life, breath, and all things. Now we're going to talk about that. He gives life and he gives breath and he gives all. Now things was added because this is neuter. In the Greek, you've got masculine, feminine, neuter. Neuter could be inanimate. It could be a rock, tree. Well, a tree's not inanimate. Uh, it could be a rock. It could be, it could be anything. But let's read it this way. He himself gives to all life and breath and all. Could be things. I don't have any problem with that translation. But folks, what he's given, he's given to all. This is the point. What is he given? Life, breath, and all. Okay. And he made from one man. It doesn't have man in the original, but he made from one. But it is implied one person. Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Now, the Greeks understood this because the Greeks were world conquerors. They had boundaries. They set up and they invaded countries and they conquered countries. And before the Romans, the Greek were the ones that ruled the world. Alexander the Great, you've heard of him. The Greeks brought a lot of things. They brought a lot of great intellect, study, and they also brought a one world language. And that was certainly needed when it came time to share Christ. And he says, the boundaries of their habitation, verse 27. And they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. We're going to talk about that. Verse 28 and 29, two huge verses in the Bible. If you meditate on these two verses, I'm telling you, God will do great things. Now, he'll do great things whether you do or not. But if you meditate on these, just read them over and over. Chew on them. Say, Lord, quicken my mind. Let me hear what these verses are saying. Listen to this. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said. Now, he's talking to the people of Athens. As even some of your own poets have said. And Paul is agreeing with them. For we also are his children. He said, we're the children of the unknown God. All of us. And then he goes on in verse 29. Being the children of God, we ought not to think. Uh, let, me, let me start again. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. An image formed by the, by the art and thought of man. What he's saying here, this isn't art, and this isn't the thought of man. This is a choice made by the divine, one and only, creator of all, Yahweh. Verse 30, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, 
God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. We're going to talk about this. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We're going to talk about that. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, and here's what happens. Some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. That's good preaching. We'll hear this again. Verse 34. But some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius, Aerogapa, Aero, boy, these names are hard, Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Okay. Paul was in Athens on Areopagus, the mount. And later on, we're going to know it as Mars Hill. That's where he was. This was the message on Mars Hill. He, was, uh, he stood in the midst there on Mars Hill. And this is a rocky, rocky height overlooking the city of Athens. And this place was named after a god that they called Eris. And he was a Greek deity of war. And that was a real big deal to the Greeks because not only were they great intellects, but they were warlike. And so they gave great power to Eris. And this is a place where judges convened and they had jurisdiction over capital offenses. This is where people would, where, where a judge would decide if you live or you die. Big, big place, big deal. Well, people from Athens would come there to hear something new. They always wanted to hear something new. Some people say have their ears tickled. More than that. They just wanted to hear new things and hear what was going on. And they would come and they would hear something new. So Paul went there because he had something new for them. It wasn't new but it was new to them. Folks, that's the way it is when you talk about the love of God. The love of God is certainly not new. You know, when you share today what the Bible has always said, what early in the beginning, what the ones that were closest to the time of Christ and the time of when the actual disciples, the first disciples were sharing, when you share today what it is that they actually believe, people will call you a heretic. Because I'm afraid we've strayed so far. And, and truly, now this is the good news. The Bible really hasn't strayed. But we haven't seen what it said. Now there have been some things, some little tweaks in translations. I want you to understand this about the Bible. And this is certainly not a put down. The, the Bible that we read, the English Bible, or whatever Bible it is, it's translated into most of the world languages. And day by day, uh, an organization called Wycliffe Bible Translators, one of my dear brothers is a fundraiser for Wycliffe Bible Translators. It's a hugely important thing because not only does the Holy Spirit reveal Christ to your spirit with or without the Bible, the greatest things we're seeing, the greatest works that are going on now in all of the world, probably number one would be Iran. And that's without the scriptures. Christ is showing up in dreams and visions and he's speaking the truth to them and they're believing and they're receiving and they're sharing this truth. And tragically, many, if not most of them are killed, tortured and killed. And yet it can't stop it. Same things going on in China. Same things going. You know, the Middle East is the fastest growing area in the world with this new message, with this message of the love of God for all men. And yet they're paying a great price. That's why I'm so proud of my, my dear brother Robinson Sadiq in Pakistan. I mean, where he is, there's a great price to be paid for sharing this message. But you can't not share the love of God. In our country, the U.S., we're in Canada, or in the Western world as we know it, they, they won't kill you, but they'll sure talk about you. And they'll say ugly things about you. They'll even lie. All kinds of things. They won't kill you in those countries. They will. But the message is spreading. Well, Paul used, this is a big thought. Paul used what was at hand to make illustration to share the good news. He talked about the life, the death, and the resurrection. That is the good news. Life, death, or the death, burial, and the resurrection. We call that the gospel. He was sharing the gospel. Many times we say, he shared the gospel. And I want to say, no, he did not. No, he talked about stuff, but he never shared the gospel, which was the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. 
It took place at a point in time, but in eternity it was already finished. The cross is eternal. The last words Christ, or the, among the last words that he quoted from the cross were, it is finished. And then he said, into your hands I give up my spirit. They didn't take his life, he gave it up. He said, Father, forgive them. Talking about you, talking about me. He said, for they do not know what they do. Now, Paul didn't know in advance what he was going to say. He didn't. It was not planned out. The Spirit of God gave him utterance. The Bible says that if you're before kings, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Spirit of God will he'll speak through you. Now, some of you may say, I could never do this, Brother Craig. I couldn't do this. I, I'm just, I just can't do that. I can't speak like that quickly. My mind doesn't work that way. And I want to say to you, don't worry about it. It does. You just don't know it. You don't have to worry about what you're going to say in a situation. God will give you utterance. The Holy Spirit will. So I want to say, yes, you could do this. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. Count on it. Well, the thing is, for you to speak truth, you have to know the truth. Last week, I talked about Jesus being the truth. Jesus is the truth, both the way and the life. It's not three different things. It's one thing. Jesus is the truth. He's the way and he's the life. Now, this is a life that's given to all men, but the way is you need to believe it. There's only one way to Christ. I mean, to God the Father, and that's through Christ. But the good news is he's dealt with that for all men. All men don't know it. All men haven't believed it, but what he did for one, he did for all. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, one of my favorite verses. I keep coming back to it. The Bible says, when one died, all died. When one died, all died. When Christ died, you died. Romans 6, 4 represents all men too. It says, when he was buried, you were, when he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. And when he was raised, you were raised to walk in newness of life. But you don't know it. Believe it. Some of you have never known this. Never believe that I'm telling you. His life is your life. The true gospel the, of the cross. You know enough to share. You're, you're not trying to get people to do anything. That's the problem that we've had in the past. Now, I'm not against planning. I'm not. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying don't do that. But I am telling you this. If you have any other motive than sharing the truth of who people are, what Christ has done for all men, if you have any motive to try to get people to stop anything or start anything, I'm telling you, you're dealing with wrong motives. And tragically, there are a lot of people dealing with wrong motives. People want people to stop drinking, to get a job, to... Stop drugs, to start this, stop beating their wives, stop doing this, start doing this. Folks, that's eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He never intended for us, for us to eat from that tree. Do right, avoid wrong. Sounds great. Preach is great. It's just not the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Okay. You're telling the good news Asking them to believe it. That's what you're doing. You're sharing the good news, the death, the burial, and the resurrection for all men. And you're asking them to believe it. And the Holy Spirit does it all. Well, Paul shared what he observed in verse 22. Now, I want you to see something. Paul was not condemning. Folks, we talk about, I'll just use one example. We could talk about the Muslims. You say, oh yeah, everybody, it's easy to jump on them. Paul wouldn't have been condemning about that. He would have shared the truth. The way you get somebody to hear the truth is not by putting down what they know or what they think they know. If you go into a ghetto into the, or if you go into the jungle or if you go someplace where, the, where there's poverty unmatched and they're wearing rags and you know in your heart you've got new clothes in your truck or in your van or in your valise or in your bag. You've got something that you want to give them that is better than what they've got. You know it, but they don't. And if you try to take the little they have away from them because you know you've got something better, you know what will happen? They'll fight you to the death. Your death or their death. Folks, that's happening all over the world. 
We're saying your way's wrong, our way's right. And so you destroy their way and they never hear you. Tell them the truth. The one thing that can't be denied, the one thing that there is no natural defense for is love. The love of God. When our brother Paul, uh, William Paul Young, we call him Paul, when he comes to be with us, I don't have to wonder what Paul's going to talk about. I haven't given him any suggestions and I'm not going to. Because I know Paul. I know what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about the love of God. And as my young friend over at, she's older now than when I was there, but a young friend over in Romania, this young girl, beautiful girl, she said she read the Shuk. And I said, what did you get from it? And she was doing a video message for Paul. And she said, I saw that God has a very big love. She got the book. If you don't see that, you missed the whole point of the book. God has a very big love for all men. Good guys, he loves them. This is the part we struggle with. Bad guys, he loves them. It has nothing to do with them. The love of God has nothing to do with the one that he's loving. It has everything to do with the nature of God. Well, he was examining the objects Paul was. They were worshiping and he saw that they were worshiping an unknown God. And Paul begins to tell them about this unknown God. Well, I'm afraid. Now this is, I, don't, I don't mean to be ugly, but I'm just going to say it. You know, I'm 71 years old now. And the older I get, I'm not saying I'm not concerned, but the older I get, the less concerned I am about what you think of me. But I'm afraid that today, this real unknown God is not known very well by even those that call themselves Christians. Because if you see God as a vengeful, wrathful God, Two things, you don't understand vengeance and you don't understand wrath and you certainly don't understand God. The nature of God, for God is love. That is his nature. Some things I want you to know. What do we know about this own unknown God? He knows you. He knew you from before you were created. That's when he chose you. How did he cho choose you? He chose you in love. He loves you. It says you were pre in love, you were predestined to adoption as sons. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. We know that he gave his life. People jump in and say, for you. He did, but that's not what I'm going to say. He gave his life to you as well as for you. And the fourth thing I want you to know about this unknown God, and I'm speaking to you. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to know Him. And this is the same the world over. And there is no defense for these four things, that you're known by God, that you're loved by God, and that God in the person of Jesus, sent by the Father, drawn, you drawn to Him by the Holy Spirit, gave his life to you. And we'll see that he did it before time was created, but in time it was fleshed out. Ready? Not at the cross, but at the creation. When he created man, Yahweh, I am, I am that I am, who Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am. We're talking about the pre-incarnate Christ. It's always been this way. Yahweh, when he created man from the dust of the earth, the very first thing he did after he created man was breathe life into man. Whose life? He breathed his life into man. Man wasn't just alive. He possessed the literal breath of God, the life of God. And this is the same the world over. Now, today, many people attempt to worship this unknown God. This unknown God, Yahweh, Jesus, they attempt to worship him in ignorance. How do I mean worship him in ignorance? I used to have a saying, well, I'm, I mean, there I was. 
for a big percentage of my life. I used to say, this is what I used to say, we're saved to serve, not sit. Boy, does that preach good. Whoo! Saved to serve. You're saved to serve, folks. Get busy. It's not what the Bible teaches at all. You're not saved to serve. You're saved to be loved. The Bible says in Him, you were chosen holy. That's how you were chosen. Colossians 3.12. You were chosen set apart. Today, we're not going to talk about it, but in other times I will. At this conference, I will. Folks, you were set apart from before time existed. That's the word holy. Paul said he was set apart from his mother's womb. He said, when it pleased him to reveal himself in me, not to me, Paul talking, so that I could preach him in the nations, not to the nations. Well, this is the same the world over. People try to worship God in ignorance. They try to do something for their worship. Same thing that Adam and Eve did. They believe in the same lie today that Adam and Eve believed when he said, you need to do something to be like God. And God had said, don't eat from that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good, from evil, good and evil. Eat from the tree of life. He wants you to know as you're known. He wants you to know the way he feels about you. And in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says one day you'll know as you're known. It said we look through cloudy glass now, but that cloud's going to be removed. One day you'll know how he feels about you. What I used to see, because I was looking at it from a wrong paradigm. What I used to see when I would see that verse, I would see, well, yeah, one day you're going to know as you're known. Yeah, one day you're going to know all the wicked things you did. That's what I used to think. And that's what's taught. Examine yourself, Paul said. And I used to say, oh boy, I better check myself out. Oh, see all the sin. I used to write it down to get a piece of paper and I had to get a big piece of paper and I'd write down all my sins for that day. Ooh, all of them. Write them all down. I'm sure I missed a ton. And then I'd write 1 John 1, 9 over it so that I was covered. Paul was talking about examine yourself. He was talking about See who you are in Christ. You're saying, is sin important? Yeah. God hates sin because sin harms you and he loves you. And that's not who you are. So for you to continually deal with sin, you're, you're on a failing walk. You're heading toward a cliff. And you'll never be able to do anything about it. You can't fix sin. The only way sin can be dealt with, it must die. And here's the good news. It did. In Christ, sin died. So did you. That is not your nature. You say, well, how do you stop sinning? I can tell you this, not by trying to stop sinning. <laughs> I'm an expert on that. So are you. You've tried. You've failed. And the more you try, the more you fail. The more you fail, the more you try. And the more you try, the more you fail. And it never changes. And you're on this terrible walk. Jesus said, stop that. Look at who you are in me. You know what? I don't have any desire to drink from a mud puddle. I watch dogs. I love dogs. I watch them walking in the neighborhood. They'll be walking with you panting. <laughs> we have a lot of labs around here and they walk and that old tongue hangs out and they see a mud puddle. They just cannot help themselves. They get in that mud puddle and splash around their dog. What do they know? And then they've been working so hard and they're thirsty. So what do they do? They drink out of that mud puddle. They don't know that there's clean water back at the house. Just wait a minute. And they can drink the clean water that you give them. But they're dogs. What do they know? Folks, that's the same way people try to live today. They're drinking from mud puddles. They don't know. He wants you to know as you're known. Well, what do we know about him? Verse 20, 24. In verse 24, it says that he made the world and all things in it. You could say individual. He made all the individuals too. He made everything. This is too big to understand. If you try to wrap your mind around this, you'll never get it. It's too big. Whatever you think about God, know this. It's bigger than that. And then in verse 25, now this is a verse that I want you to see. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need 
to be served by human hands. This word served, it could be translated worshiped. Now, this is something I didn't even know. It could be translated heal, cure, restore to health. Now, am I saying there's anything wrong with using a doctor? You shouldn't go to a doctor? Absolutely not. God has empowered those guys to do healing things. But we're finding out today a lot of what we did years ago. We think that's just butchery. Things have changed and they're changing as we speak. So it is not our call or place just to cure people. And I'm not saying don't operate. I'm not saying don't go to a doctor. It's not what I'm saying. I do those things. But I'm telling you, God has done things as I prayed. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes I don't even know what to pray for. I am telling you all that is needed. I'm talking about in the human condition now. God has already given. People, and this is tragedy, people try to fix people with the gospel. That was never God's intent. You know that people don't need to be fixed. They are. They just need to know. And this word, not served by human's hands, this is what we call present passive. It's a present tense passive voice. That means something caused the action. We're thinking that our efforts cause action for God. It's the other way around. God's efforts cause action in me. My actions don't cause action in him. We've got it exactly backwards. I used to say, we're the only hands God has on this earth. Oh, so spiritual. Doesn't that sound spiritual? Oh, we're the only hands God has on this earth. I'm not going to use the English word, but I will use the Greek word. That's a pile of scubula. And you can look it up if you want to. Some people might say, I'm calling BS on that. And you know what this stands for. You are not the only hands God has on this earth. He doesn't need your hands. He needs nothing. Will you serve? Of course you will. Because it's who you are. Well, he himself. Now look at this. I want you to see this verse 25. This is a big verse here. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all. Now, this word, he himself, is what we call a reflexive pronoun. I could say, he gives to all. Perfect. In the Greek, the verb carries the noun or the pronoun, or not the noun, but the pronoun with it. It doesn't need anything attached. I could say, himself gives all things. He's making a point. When this is in there, there's a point being made by the Holy Spirit. And here it is. He, that's right, him, not you, he himself gives to all. He's making a point, and here's what he gives. Ready? Life and breath and all things. Life. Zoe. You know, that's where we get our word zoology from. Zoology is a study of life. Zoology. That's what that word means. Life. I'm not just talking about being alive. And we know the kind of life he's talking about. It goes back to the, in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when he breathed life into man. And then here it says breath. This is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. The only time. This literally is the breath of life. Back to Genesis 2, 7. And then it says all things, and you could translate that all. The life and breath go together. In Job chapter 33, verse 4, here's what it says. And this is the same context and, and the same word in the Hebrew. The Spirit of God made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. It's the breath of God that gives life. Not just talking about being alive. When God created the animals, he created them alive, but he didn't breathe his life into them. 
In verse 26, it said he made one, uh, from one man all nations. We're talking about the creation. Some people say, I don't believe that. Now, let's just go with what it says here, okay? From one man, Adam, he made all the nations. That means when he created Adam, that he loved. That when Adam sinned, he sought. That when Adam sinned and Adam thought of himself as dead. In other words, thought of himself as separated from God. When Adam became dead to the fact that his life was in Christ. When he became dead to that fact, Yahweh, the pre-incarnate Christ, sought Adam and Eve. And when he found them, he found them. They didn't find him. I used to say, I found Christ wrong. I realized who he was. When he, when God the Father, through God the Son, found Adam and Eve, he made a blood sacrifice. Now you say, I, I, I'm not trying to read more into this than it is, but I will tell you this. This is the first picture of the cross. There was an innocent animal slain, which represented Christ on the cross. The first picture of the cross in the Bible. And he made a covering for man's sin. It's always been about the cross. The cross is eternal. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made from one man all nations. God is in charge of history. God set the boundaries. And this was a big deal to the Greeks who at one time ruled the whole known world. And he's telling them that God was in charge of every bit of this. And they were hearing him. In verse 27, let me read you verse 27. And he says, and they would seek God. And that's what man has always done. Seek God. They don't know God, but they're seeking. And they're seeking God in the wrong places. If perhaps they might grope. That's like a blind man feeling his way. And this is what's going on. They're blind. They're blind. The problem is not that they don't do right. The problem is that they're blind. We need to ask God to open their eyes. Open their eyes to truth. The problem is they don't see. They don't see who Christ is and what He's done. And they're groping around, groping around. Tragically. For Him and trying to find Him. Though He is not far from each one of us. He's, he's not far. In fact, how close is He? In me. That's where he was with Paul. Christ was revealed in him. He was set apart, the Bible says, in Galatians 1, from his mother's womb. He was declared holy. That's what that word means, from his mother's womb, from before he was born. Oh man, this is so big. In verse, in verse uh, 28 and 29, these may be, the two biggest words in the Bible concerning you, and they are in him, in him. Look at verse 28 and 29 for in him. Look at this. Now understand who he's talking to. He's talking to the unbelieving, groping for God Greeks. For in him, then he says, we, he's talking about himself and he's talking about them. For in Him, whoa, this is huge, folks. These two verses are among the most important verses in the Bible. For in Him, we live and move and exist. And even some of your own poets have said, for we also are His children. He's talking to the Greeks, being children of God. Then he goes on to clarify this and, and, and build on it. Being then the children of God. Again, he's talking to the Greeks. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. The divine nature is not like gold or silver or stone. Gold, the most valuable thing on the planet at that time. Silver, right behind it. Stone, it's what you build your monuments with. An image formed by art and the thought of man. God's not like that. He's much bigger than that. Much bigger. Much, much bigger. He said in verse 28, 29, we live. That's where we have life, is in Him. We move in Him. We exist. He said they exist in their country, on the planet. No, it's not what he's talking about. It says we exist. We have our being in Him. 
and in Him we are His children. This is what Paul's telling the Greeks. In Him. This was even before they believed. We would say today, now here's where people are going to come down on me. But I'm not making this up. I didn't write this. This was even before they believed. We would say today, this is before they were saved. But people don't understand what saved is. Saved, we're saved by the life of Christ in Him. Now, do we need to believe it? Yes. I, understand. I don't have any problem with being saved. I was. It was when I came to know Him the way He sees me. When I believed Him and I received His life that He'd already given me, but I received it as my own. I didn't understand, but I received as mine what He said He'd given to me. Things were already given at the cross. And then Paul goes on to talk about the resurrection of the dead. We will see that this good news was given to all men, even those who didn't believe. Now, he says, being the children of God in verse 29, this is a present condition. This is who they are. This is present tense. Not who it will be. Not when you believe. Being, continuous action, present tense. This is not a potential fact. This is a present fact. This is reality, even though they did not know it. The children, this word is offspring, race, descendant, same nature. Through the first Adam, all were created. Through the first Adam, all died. Through the last Adam, Jesus, Romans 5.18, all were made alive. He gave the justification of life. Some people, most, give the first Adam more power than the last Adam. They'll agree, yep, condemnation are all men, the last Adam. Justification of life to all men. I don't believe that. People got to do something. No. The last Adam is the one who matters. This divine nature is not like created things, gold, silver, stone. This divine nature is life. It's given. Divine nature is not created by man. It is life given by God. You have this life. You must believe it to benefit from it. Receive it as your own because it's real. And then he says in verse 30, God overlooked ignorance. That's what he's doing today. It's what he did with you. I was talking to a farmer the other day. I was in a store, a meat market. And I was telling them about what was coming. And some of them didn't know who Paul was. And I said he wrote The Shack. And they got on their phone, started typing. And it came up. And they saw the movie too. He said, you mean he did this? They'd heard of it then. I said, yeah, that's him. Wow. And then I said, you know, people have a problem with him sometimes. And the problem is that his picture of the love of God is bigger than theirs. And I gave an illustration. I walked outside with this farmer. And this farmer, he was a country-looking guy in dirty clothes because he'd been working. But he farmed a couple thousand acres. Do the math. Uh, this farmer was not a poor guy. You look at him, he looked like a homeless guy, but he was not. Working man, big farmer. Had a lot of people working for him. Good guy. We walk outside and you said, you know that love of God thing? That was concerning me. I said, I was the kind of man that I would have not let come around my house when my daughter was young. I wouldn't have let me around. I wasn't a good guy. And yet, God chose me. God chose to reveal himself to me. He changed me the way I thought. We're going to talk about that. He changed the way I saw things. As a result, I'm standing here today talking to you. And I could see as I was telling him those things, tears just kind of welled up in his eyes when he started nodding his head. He was thinking, yep, that was me too. Then we walked to his truck. Everybody down here drives a truck. He said, I want to go to that meeting. I want to go to that meeting. I said, you'll hear about it. Folks, God loves the unlovely. He overlooked their ignorance. And now he's declaring that all men should repent. Okay. Let me tell you what I used to thought that, that meant. I used to think that meant. I used to think that means you need to change. Repent. You need to change. 
You do. But it literally means change your mind, not change your actions. No man can change his action on his own. You say, well, you can decide. Yeah, really? Let me know how that works out for you. Repent. You go from one of unbelief to belief. You go from unknowing to know. You go from unreceiving to receiving. What? You believe that the God of creation gave you his life from before time existed. You believe that the one you didn't know loves you unconditionally. And you receive his life that is eternal as your life. Folks, you do these things. I hate to even use that word do. But you believe these things. It will change everything. He says he's going to judge the world in righteousness. People say, yeah, yeah, he's going to judge the world, all right. <laughs> I got no problem with that. In John chapter 3, uh, I'm going to read a few verses to you. Verse uh, 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light of man, I'm sorry, the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. Judgment. I want to tell you how you, do you realize the word judgment, the word justice, and the word righteous all come from the same root? God has judged the world righteous. That's what the word says. We think of it as punitive. It's not the way God thinks. That's the way man thinks. That's the way you think eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God loves. We punish. Everybody except us, of course. Resurrection of the dead. Now this is where the problem came in verse 31. His resurrection was our resurrection. When he talked about that, the dead being raised... There were three reactions, same three you see today. Some sneered, the word is mocked, made fun of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some said, oh, that's, that's pretty interesting. That's good preaching. Yeah. Oh, we're going to come back and hear you again. Yeah, I'm going to be back. You still see that today. But it says, some joined him and believed. Now, this word believe, everything else was temporary. It was present tense, ongoing. This word is aorist. This word means completed action, can't be done again, and can't be undone. Some believed once and for all. It's the only aorist tense used. You can sneer and later on believe. You can say, yeah, that's pretty good stuff. One day, one day, and believe. But folks, once you've truly seen and believed, your life is transformed. It's just like today. This is for all men, even you. You can see why this is important. Folks, share this with people. I love you guys. And...